to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I am joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker of The Week, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is the host of the hugely popular Bulwark Daily Podcast, Charlie Sykes. Welcome one and all. Well, it really is uh, Infrastructure Week, finally. Uh, It happened. The Senate, well, at least the Senate did, the Senate voted to move forward on a $1 trillion infrastructure bill. It passed it by a vote of 69 to 30. So that included uh, 19 uh, Republicans voted for this. So I'm going to start with you, Bill Galston. There are a lot of moving parts here. We are a long way from actual passage for a lot of complicated reasons. But my first question to you is, is this a vindication of Biden's philosophy that bipartisanship is still possible? Or would anybody have been able to do this? Uh, No, I don't think just any old president would have been able to do this. Uh, President Biden deliberately created the political space for these negotiations, not only to start, but to persist through many difficulties. Uh, He sent his top negotiator, Steve Reschetti, uh, who is very, very good at his job, uh, to be the administration's daily interlocutor. Uh, And Mr. Biden made it very clear to his party Uh, in both the House and the Senate, that he wanted this to happen. Uh, And he celebrated it when it did. Uh, And I think a president less committed to the idea of the Senate as it used to be would probably not have achieved this result. Okay. Um, So, Charlie Sykes, um, some people have said that the Republicans are the ones who've actually gotten the better of this because they can prove that they're not obstructionist. They can eliminate a, um, an incentive for the Democrats to turn to eliminating the filibuster. Um, and they don't have to vote for a lot of things they don't like. They can vote for just stuff that's incredibly popular. All of all of that is true, um, and, and obviously this this does strengthen the arguments against eliminating the filibuster. But I have to I have to agree with uh, with Bill uh, about the victory for Joe Biden. Uh, you know, on one level, historically, the, the, anything that allows senators to spend money is going to be popular. So the easiest thing for Congress to do is to vote for and pass big spending bills. On the other hand. Given the current political climate, uh, given the the darts being thrown from the orange Versailles against all of this, uh, uh, given the addiction to to tribalism and to gridlock, I think it's amazing that 19 Republicans were willing to ignore Trump and go along and and vote for this. I, I think I can't find any pundit, by the way, that called this shot. And I think that that's an indication of of the of the success. Uh, I you know there were hundreds of articles written about how naive Joe Biden was, how out of touch Joe Biden was in thinking that he could work across the aisle. Um, I I have a stack here of clippings of uh, of really smart people explaining why this was never going to happen, why the negotiations were uh, in dire shape, uh, uh, how it was all falling apart, and then it happened. So, uh, yeah, kudos to the administration and for Joe Biden not not giving up on it. So um, but but you're right. I mean, obviously, this is going to be a short lived moment of celebration. I think that the uh, bipartisan glow lasted for about what, about five minutes before (laughs) they they went on to the voterama. Uh, But it's clearly one, one of the high points of the of the Biden presidency. Yeah. So, Damon, um, the the problem comes in now, or at least what this sets up is a real battle within the Democratic Party, uh, because um, Nancy Pelosi has said she will present the she will not present this bill as a standalone 
Um, although the moderates in her party wanted a quick vote in the House on the Senate-passed bill, you had um, Representative Josh Gottheimer, for example, the Democrat of New Jersey, one of the moderates who said, when you've got a bill that will create 2 million jobs a year with the support of the AFL-CIO and the Chamber of Commerce, all coming together with Democrats and Republicans, and by the way, the president, why would we not bring this to a vote and get it done immediately? Um, but Pelosi said no. She uh, is only going to present this for a vote in the House after the Senate passes the reconciliation bill, which contains all the really big spending wish list of the um, Democrats and the progressives, including you know huge amounts of new spending on what's called human infrastructure. Um, so how do you, first of all, what do you think about the strategy? And two, how do you think it turns out? Well, uh, the, on both, I'm just sort of going to, I just offer idle speculation because there are so many intricacies involved here. I mean, you mentioned, and I think summarized quite well, the initial immediate kind of strategic calculation going on here that has to do mainly with ideology, where you have the progressive faction of the Democratic Party wanted a much, much larger bill than the one that the Senate passed uh, on, on a bipartisan basis. And they've sort of gone along with this plan to pass that first in the expectation that there will be the second bill that will pass on a party line vote and then all the other goodies that they wanted will be in that bill. But uh, and so Pelosi is trying to placate the progressives who who have kind of set it up in this way. But there's a whole other dimension that I don't even feel qualified to pronounce on that Bill would know a little bit more about, I think, which has to do with the procedural hurdles we're talking about here, where you have two totally different kinds of bills, one of which has to, uh, you know, it, ha it had to be passed on a procedural vote first, and it did with bipartisan support, and then this other second, much larger $3.5 trillion bill that, that was passed on the narrowest of partisan basis. And then but it still has no content in it. So all that has to be filled in, then it has to be passed through reconciliation. And then the order in which they're voted on in the House is also very complicated for procedural reasons. So your second question, like how likely is this to work is, frankly, hell if I know. I mean, I, I can't even begin to game out all of the potential points at which either a moderate or a progressive in either body of Congress, I guess in the House it would take two or three progressives or moderates to scuttle it, whereas in the Senate it would just take one, uh, where it could be blown up. So this is like threading a needle while going down the steep uh, incline of a roller coaster at the same time. So, yeah. I, I mean, it's really, really hard. But then again, I, I will certainly uh, go along with what Bill and Charlie both said, that Biden has done so far a really spectacular job of getting us here so far. And so I, I'm, you know, I, I won't say it's guaranteed by any means, but I'm sort of willing to put my faith in him and his team to negotiate this. And also we, a, a modest round of applause for Chuck Schumer for managing to get us this far in the Senate as well. Um, it really, it, it, we've gone further than I thought was likely when all of this was first hatched a few, uh, a few months ago. And, uh, we're just going to have to see over the coming two months if each step in this like 18 step process can be landed in exactly the right way so that all the factions stay together. My last final kind of postscript to that comment is this maybe, just maybe, puts into a new light why Biden threw such a uh, juicy and sloppy bone uh, to the progressives last week in the uh, eviction moratorium issue that we talked about last week, that all of us were sort of, well, Bill, Bill was sort of in between, but the rest of us were quite negative about this. Maybe this was part of a deeper deal. Like, look, all right, progressives, I will give you what you want on the eviction moratorium and show that I'm with you in good faith on your priorities, but you have to stay in line and help me get this thing passed.
Um, that could have been a goodwill gesture in that respect. I don't know if that's true. I'm just speculating, but I like the idea. So, Linda, there's there is going to be a vote on this until September. And by the way, I cannot imagine what life is going to be like over the next several weeks for the poor people who actually have to draft the legislation, thousands of pages. Yes. I, mean, I picture those poor guys in basements in the Capitol, you know, typing away and on K Street, which is actually where legislation is usually written. Let's be real. But um, <laughs> but in any event, um, look, the 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 um, the, the three point five trillion uh, human infrastructure thing is is going to be really tricky. Um, it includes all kinds of things, and and both um, you know, contrary to what the Republicans say about the Democrats that they're a party full of you know Bernie Sanders and AOCs, actually no, there's a there's a big moderate faction, and two of them are in the Senate uh, named Senate. Well, there are more than two, but the most prominent ones and the most vocal. Uh, opponents of this are are Kirsten Cinema and and Joe Manchin, who have both made comments publicly that while they voted to advance this legislation to the point of negotiation to move things forward, they are not comfortable at all with spending three point five trillion on uh, on human infrastructure, and um, and so you know I guess uh, people are hoping the, the moderates are hoping that, uh, that they can pare it back the way, because, you know, this original, even this hard infrastructure bill, which was when it was first introduced, I think it was more than 2 trillion. So it was cut in half. Um, what do you think? Well, uh, it reminds me of being a nine year old, uh, on the stage in Denver, Colorado at an auditorium in which I was dressed as if I were in the 18th century and being asked to perform a quadrille with a bunch of nine-year-old uh, girls and boys. And I can tell you it didn't come off well. Um, you know, this is, it, it's just, um, this is so incredibly complicated. And the way in which it's being devised so that one bill cannot move forward unless the other bill moves forward. And of course, we have no idea what's in the other bill yet, um, in which Nancy Pelosi seems to be uh, trying to appease the left wing uh, progressives in the House uh, by suggesting, you know, unless both bills get votes, um, then we're not, you know, we're, the, the uh, bill that basically everyone supports. I mean, 19 Republicans, including Mitch McConnell. Uh, yep. Let's hear it from Mitch. That was, you know, <laughs> that was a good thing he did the other day. Um, but, you know, even calling the other bill human infrastructure, I think, you know, is a little bit deceptive. What we're really seeing is a mass expansion of the welfare state, uh, a mass expansion of the social safety net. And maybe it's time to do that. I'm, I'm not here to, to say that we should never even think of such things as paid parental leave or paid sick leave. Um, these are things where I think the United States does lag uh, behind other industrial nations in not providing its workers. And, uh, you know, I, I think these are things that ought to be debated. But the way in which this is being done means that we don't have any hearings on these subjects. We're not going to, in fact, sit down and hear from uh, expert witnesses to try to tell us what the effect might be, the economic effects, the social effects, uh, even, you know, the, the great society programs and, and the New Deal uh, did not get sort of shoved together in this way um, without there being, uh, you know, open debate and, and you know, some people and, and, you know, Bill may correct me, I may be wrong on this. Um, I will, I will acknowledge that I haven't studied the New Deal that carefully. Uh, but certainly I was around during the Great Society. And, you know, these issues uh, were issues that the public got familiar with. It, it reminds me of the great overhaul in terms of health care that Obama pushed through. It turns out that maybe, you know, having national health care was a good thing. Um, certainly during a pandemic, it's very helpful that people have access to doctors and has access to vaccines and treatment if they become sick. But one of the objections I had at that time was that it was so entirely partisan with no Republicans really supporting it. And I think it would be a real mistake to push through some of these other measures uh, without buy-in. 
um, I think it will further uh, divide us. And, you know, in a certain very funda- fundamental way, I think it's not democratic. So uh, I'm not pleased that the $3.5 uh, trillion program is being put out there uh, as something that we have to accept if we're going to accept the, um, the in- actual infrastructure uh, bill, which I think is important, and I'm glad they're passing it. And again, there may be parts of the $3.5 trillion that absolutely uh, are meritorious, but let's talk about them. Let's, let's have real discussion and debate about what we need, absolutely need, uh, and, you know, some things we probably don't. Uh, yeah, Linda, you're so 1990s, honestly, <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> you know, debate and hearings and all that. I mean, come on, we don't do that anymore. We, we, we <laughs> negotiate in, in the middle of the night in the, in the speaker's office, and then we rush through a huge reconciliation package and it has everything in it. And, uh, that's the way it goes. Although I don't know, Bill, it seems to me that, uh, uh, you know, my memory of the of the New Deal is that it was actually pretty slapdash, and they threw things together without too much uh, too much debate or or uh, or hearings in that case too. But well, that was uh, certain, that was certainly true at the beginning. Yeah, uh, you know, Congress was receiving uh, legislative proposals from the White House in the morning and passing them through both houses by the afternoon. And that <laughs> happened repeatedly in the first six months. On the other hand, it was a genuine national emergency. Correct. And there was an excellent argument. I wonder if I could just add a little bit of texture to the political situation, if there's time. Please. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are a couple of important facts to keep in mind, looking first at the Senate and then at the House. Uh, fact number one, you've already alluded to. I don't think there are 50 votes for a reconciliation bill uh, that spends $3.5 trillion over the next 10 years. As a matter of fact, I'm close to metaphysically certain uh, that those votes aren't there. So there is going to be, and this will make Linda happier, if not entirely happy, there is going to be an extended public debate over what is going to stay in the bill and what is going to stay out of it. Will it be full regular order? I can't guarantee that. But this is not going to be something uh, that is just going to be rushed through behind closed doors because the votes aren't there to do it that way. Uh, With regard to the House, uh, I would compare the situation there to a very difficult Rubik's Cube. Uh, Because right now, uh, you have moderate Democrats threatening to withhold their votes uh, from the budget resolution, which is what is the which is what the voting is about right now, uh, because uh, well, for two reasons. First of all, they're not at all sure that they support the three point five trillion dollar figure, especially this is true for you know, representatives from high-tax states, especially if all of it is going to be paid for with, with tax increases. But more to the point, uh, some of the moderates are taking the position that they're not going to vote on the uh, budget bill until they get a date certain in September uh, for a vote on the infrastructure bill. On the other side, the progressives are saying that unless the $3.5 trillion bill goes first, not just the budget resolution, but the actual bill, uh, that they are going to withhold their votes from the infrastructure uh, bill that came over from the Senate. And if they do that, it would take a lot of Republicans to counterbalance the loss of at least half of the Progressive Caucus, which would be at least 50 votes. Are there 50 Republican votes for an infrastructure bill and an up or down vote? I don't know. Uh, But I can tell you this, uh, the right wing media are pounding the infrastructure bill. I've been reliably informed by people who are very strongly backing it and members of organizations who are very strongly backing it. And with every passing day, it gets harder and harder to hold the line. 
All right. Well, um, we we shall be keeping a close eye on this. I do hope could, uh, with could, Linda. Could, could I Sorry. make one comment here? Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. I, I, I was thinking about it, and I, and I agree with it. Everything has been said here, and the, the, the lack of transparency is an important issue because, unfortunately, that also means it's going to be loaded with all sorts of ghastlies that are going to make it uh, you know, a big target for critics. I mean, all of these omnibus and chromnibus bills tend to tend to be these massive bloated crap sandwiches with all sorts of special interest uh, giveaway. I actually also. I'm puzzled by Nancy Pelosi's position on this. It, it almost borders on political malpractice that she would tie the two together. And of course, she's now being squeezed. I think a lot of what's going on now, though, is, is sort of the kabuki theater that we're, we're used to. And that in the end, the, the, you know, something will happen. They will do it because failure is not an option. But I also, listening to Linda, it occurs to me, once again, we're seeing how bad Democrats are at messaging. Because this is being compared to the great, you know, being compared to the other great initiatives of previous Democratic presidents, right? But Roosevelt called his the Great Society, and then of course we Johnson. had. Johnson. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, FDR called uh, you know his plan the New Deal. Lyndon Johnson, uh, it was the Great Society, and Joe Biden, human infrastructure. They don't even have a name for it. <laughs> they, they don't even they didn't even try to come up with a fair deal of the new frontier or anything. It's human <laughs> infrastructure, which is a silly phrase. I mean, it really is kind it's, of you yeah, know, because, yeah, yeah. okay, that's just sort of like, you know, it's it's it's, it's it does not resonate. It so, doesn't sing, does it? <laughs> at, at 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 some point, if there is a big vision behind it, maybe they ought to bother doing all of that. But uh so, mm. something something will happen, but I agree. It's it's not going to be three point five trillion dollars. All right. Well, we will keep a close eye and perhaps even have debates on some of the elements. For example, I'm, uh, I'm I wish that the climate um, features were uh, were a little different because if you're going to spend this amount of money, uh, we could be doing things that would really uh, really be great instead of things that are probably just going to put money in the pockets of uh, electric car makers and others. All right. Um, let us now turn to uh, the state of the Republican Party. So the Democrats are having a fight with the between the moderates and the progressives over how to spend huge amounts of trillions of dollars. Um, and uh, and the Republicans are in the midst of a resurgence of the COVID virus, the Delta surge. Um, they are making war on public health. Um, so you've got. Uh, Ron DeSantis, uh, if you look at the candidate, you know, likely candidates for president in 2024, if Trump is not the nominee, which would only happen if he chooses not to be. But anyway, um, they are resisting the idea of mask mandates. They are passing rules in their states that forbid independent private businesses from uh, requiring masks or or asking for proof of vaccines. Um Last year, uh, just uh, last month, DeSantis was selling gear that, you know, like uh, flags and so on that said, don't Fauci my Florida. So Damon Linker, um, it, you know, they, they are appealing, these Republicans, to a very, very narrow subset of the American population that is the hardcore Republican primary voter types. Um but uh, first of all, do you think that this is going to be successful for them? Well, it depends on what you mean by successful. If by successful you mean um, help to keep down rates of COVID <laughs> in their <laughs> states, uh, then I don't think it's going to be successful. Uh, if you mean politically, I, I sort of am inclined to think that it probably will be. Um, I see all of this as ultimately an example of the old conservative nostrum that politics is downstream from culture and that you then have to add in the added line from our own time that uh, politics uh, is pushed forward by accentuating those cultural differences. So I do think there is a general cultural tendency in a lot of the so-called red areas of this country to, at this point, say, well, the vaccines are available. If you want to take them, take them. If you don't, that's your business. 
Uh, we don't want no government telling us what we're going to do. Don't tell me to wear a mask. Don't tell me I have to get the vaccine. I'll decide what's best for me. That's the kind of cultural default in a lot of places in this country. And people like DeSantis and Greg Abbott of Texas and others have figured out that it is in their political interest to not only defer to that instinct, but to accentuate it and intensify it by attacking the CDC, attacking Fauci, attacking Democrats, mocking Democrats who, who are in states with much lower rates of, of Delta variant COVID infections and yet are imposing their own mask mandates and, and sort of moving back toward a, a little bit more locked down situation um, in their states. And so that sort of, uh, you know, two months ago, it seemed like, okay, the play for the right was that they were going to talk about critical race theory all the time. I think they'll still do some of that, but clearly that has now been superseded by, oh, what they're going to do is just mock public health authorities and Democrats for being little scaredy cats for, you know, being little Stalins and making everyone wear their masks in public and shutting down schools and so forth because they're afraid of a little virus. Um, I mean, it's appalling, but it's not exactly surprising. It's what you get from negative partisanship and polarization, which has swamped our politics for many years now. And then you add in a pandemic that is also now not going away, which is making people grumpy. And of course, one reason it isn't going away is that not enough people are having vaccines, the, 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 taking the vaccine that is available to them. The last thing I'll add just as a bit of a uh, a complication to the narrative that we've been kind of, the Mona, you and I have been sort of rehearsing in our remarks so far, is that some of this is a distraction on both sides, uh, including for Democrats, because the fact is DeSantis is trolling the left. He wants Democrats to come out and call him a murderer and attack him as some on the left are doing, because then he can say, look at those lunatics over there. I'm being the responsible, good American who cares about freedom, and they're attacking me. I'm a martyr to the cause for all of you. In fact, what really matters most of all are rates of vaccination, and Florida's rates of vaccination are not too bad. He's DeSantis's Florida is at about uh, about um, sixty percent, uh, I believe, for uh, at least one dose of the vaccine, which places places Florida kind of in the middle of the country. Similarly, the per capita. Uh, death rate from COVID uh, infections, uh, which of course goes all the way back to March 2020, has Florida, again, right in the middle, about 24th in the country. Is that great? Should he be crowing about this? No, but it's not a true disaster. States like Michigan have far lower vaccination rates. Arizona, uh, I believe Ohio as well. Lots of other states. Um have lower rates of vaccination. And so if the Delta variant spreads to those places, as it has been hanging out for the last month or so in the Deep South and in Florida, uh, then uh, things are going to get even uglier in those places. And so I, I would urge everyone to, yes, be somewhat appalled by what we're seeing in these red states, but also keep in mind that playing into the outrage uh, is exactly what the right hopes to get people to do. So, Charlie, I'd like you to respond to that because, you know, Damon says, well, you know, the, the uh, DeSantis is sort of playing a troll here. He wants the left to attack him. And certainly um, that may that may be right. On the other hand, you could argue that um, that the Democrats have been really poor at messaging this. We talked about the poor messaging you did about the, mm -hmm. uh, about the infrastructure bill, but, uh, not having a better name, but also about, you know, about the, the irresponsibility of Republicans who are spending their time, 
um, issuing executive orders prohibiting local governments and school districts from imposing mask mandates, for example. Um, so Greg Abbott did that in Texas. And just last week, he also has now asked hospitals in the state to postpone elective procedures mm-hmm. because the hospitals are filling up with COVID patients. And, you know, the idea, some people have argued, like Patrick Ruffini um, right. has said uh, that, look, you know, it, it, it's nobody's business. You don't have to worry about the people who are unvaccinated. Uh, it's, it's their problem. You know, it's not wise, but you know, it's not your problem, right? You're vaccinated. Go about your business and don't worry about them. But of course, that's ridiculous. Um, as we see with hospitals filling up, you know, people need hospitals for things other than COVID, right? If you have a heart attack, there was a guy in Texas who was shuttled between seven different emergency rooms because nobody had room for him. The guy was having a heart attack. Um, you know, so so obviously it does affect everybody. And um, I don't know, I just wonder why um, Democrats have not been able to message better about this, that Republicans are being, uh, you know, are playing politics with people's lives. Well, I I, I think the White White House has been somewhat forceful about this. uh, But I I guess I I am going to differ on this because I think that uh, Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott and Christy Noem are being reckless, crass and demagogic about it. And I think it's early days as we begin to see the consequences for all of this, Uh, particularly when you see the contrast between uh, their their rhetoric and their policies and then having to ask for help getting more ventilators. Uh, You know, this is one of those things where if it spins out of control, it's not a messaging problem anymore. It's not a political problem. It's a it's a public health disaster. And the position that uh, that DeSantis has essentially taken is that he's going to approach this primarily as a culture warrior. And I think he's kind of stuck. I do think that he has he has dug in so far in his position, um, anti-masks, uh, anti-vaccine requirements, getting into a fight with the with the with the cruise companies, getting into a, a fight with local school districts that he can't back off. And this, this, unfortunately, is part of our tribalized new style of politics. You can never apologize. You can never change. You can never look weak. You always have to fight. He's actively, as you pointed out, raising money off of attacking uh, Dr. Fauci. So if this thing goes south, um, there's a very real possibility that people like Greg Abbott and, and, uh, and uh, Ron DeSantis will become the face of this next phase of the Delta variant. And again, if we don't achieve herd immunity, we don't know where this is going. And to your point, Mona, about uh, Patrick Orfini, why should we care? Um, we don't know um, what, uh, you know, what, what will come from having millions of unvaccinated people out there marinating um, in some potential new variant that it could actually be more effective in breaking through. So um, right now, I do think um, these guys are are really in a very potentially dangerous place. Yes, DeSantis' position will continue to play with the Republican base. Yes, the conservative media is going to continue to rally around Ron DeSantis. Uh, all of the anti-anti-Trump folks are completely anti-anti-Ron um, DeSantis. But if this thing continues to explode and the public looks at this and goes, you know what? My kid can't go back to school or or my kid has to wear a mask or I can't get back to my life because of the unvaccinated and the politicians that didn't take a stronger position, then then I think he's got a real problem. Linda, um, this won't shock you. Um, Governors Abbott and DeSantis have found somebody to blame for the Delta surge. Guess who? Oh, it's, it's illegal. Immigrants. Right? Yes. 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 Of course. Yes. <laughs> Particularly in Florida, because, you know, they swim across, you know, from right. Guatemala, <laughs> you know, and they're a little, you know, out of shape. And, yeah. I mean, exactly. it's just utterly ridiculous. Now, there is a problem at the border and why we are not sticking needles into the arms of every single person we encounter uh, when we, uh, even those we send back to Mexico, it wouldn't hurt a bit to have a lot more people in Mexico vaccinated even. Uh, so true. I, you I know, would, by the way, we're throwing away vaccines I at this know. point that are expired. I know. Yeah, so yeah. it should be every single, and by the way, they're in our custody, so whether they like it or not, they should get the vaccine. Uh, But, you know, (laughs) one of the things I think that uh, those of us who've been very critical of people like DeSantis and Abbott and others have focused on is the number of Trump voters 
uh, whites who are not getting the vaccine. Well, it turns out it's not just whites that are not getting the vaccine. Huge numbers of blacks are not getting the vaccines, which is why you see numbers in places like Michigan uh, and in other places where there are large black populations. And it's particularly a problem among younger blacks. Um, and this, I think, is something that um, leaders in the black community need to be focused on. I mean, there was a story recently in the Washington Post about a black uh, minister who had one of these non-denominational churches and uh, a number of his uh, parishioners died. Uh, and so he you know, started on a campaign to try to, he actually brought in uh, people who would administer vaccines at church. But, you know, all of this, I think, we are going to see employers. We are going to see uh, employers starting to require uh, the vaccine. I mean, just this week, you saw United Airlines decided that all of its employees were going to be vaccinated. Southwest Delta and I believe American chose not to. I wouldn't be surprised if you wouldn't see people changing their reservations as a result of this, as I know I did. I was scheduled mm -hmm. on a Southwest flight. I'm now on a United flight. Um, I think that it's going to be the private sector that's going to make a real dent uh, in these numbers. And I think the courts will uphold the right of pri private sector employers to require this. So, Bill, are you having vertigo contemplating uh, the Republican Party going to war with private businesses <laughs> because private businesses want to do the responsible thing and the Republican elected officials want to grandstand about it? Uh, Mona, I'm glad you teed up the question that way because <laughs> that, you know, you, you made that point previously and I really wanted to come back on it, you know, because... I do not beg to differ with you in any way on that point, which I think, you know, from a broader perspective, gets pretty close to the heart, heart of the matter. Uh, you know, Damon, I think, used the phrase, don't tell me what to do, you know, to sum up the attitude uh, behind what uh, the supporters of these Republican governors are, are feeling. Well, these governors are telling all sorts of people what to do, despite the fact that the people being told what to do want to do something quite different. They are telling private employers what to do. They are telling hospitals what to do. They are telling local school districts what to do. Uh, they are using every instrument of big government available to them to regulate the choices of groups in the society who have come to the conscientious conclusion, whether for business reasons or health reasons or whatever, uh, that it is really time to mandate vaccines with very few exceptions. Uh, and I have been mucking around in politics now for more than four decades. And I have learned, sadly, that charges of hypocrisy almost never work unless the hypocrisy involves some sort of personal conduct on, on the part of the public official. So if you issue a mask mandate and then you're caught maskless in a restaurant or a bar, Mm -hmm. uh, or if you if if you claim to be a supporter of Me Too, and then you know commit every wrong in the Me Too manual, uh, that can hurt you. But if you're talking about political philosophy or what freedom means, uh, hypocrisy is no bar to popularity. Indeed, <laughs> it seems to be the gateway to it. And it just I have to say of all of the features of our current situation, it is the rank hypocrisy of people who profess to believe in individual freedom and who are denying individual freedom to substantial portions of their constituents that galls me the most. Right. Um, and it is interesting that in a lot of these states where the governors and legislatures are forbidding private companies to take 
common sense steps to protect themselves and their customers. Um, they're doing so in the face of public opinion that goes exactly the other way, where majorities believe that these things are, are necessary. Look, a symbol, a symbol of just how crazy this is, is the Florida cruise ship industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, have we forgotten how the virus spread like wildfire when it was just the plain old garden variety, COVID-19? Yeah. I mean, Delta, Delta uh, is transmitted at at least an order of magnitude higher and maybe yeah. two orders of magnitude. And, and to forbid the cruise industry to require this for people boarding their ships, what are they thinking for <laughs> I, I just, you know, yeah. Everybody I, knows that, that they don't, the cruise ships never have a problem with pathogens. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, then for our third topic, I'd like to discuss a piece that we all read uh, by uh, Noah Smith. Um, uh, he writes a, um, a column on Substack called No Opinion, a little pun there. Um, but anyway, he, he um, urge, urges us to think about the uh, possibility that uh, contrary to what we have been told by so many, that we are in a really very fraught moment in American life, that actually things may be calming down. And um, he notes that acts of domestic terrorism have been in decline since 2019. Um, he says there are fewer left-right street brawls, such as we saw in Berkeley and Portland and Charlottesville in recent years. Um, he says, if you look at Google searches, there were great peaks for Me Too and BLM and even QAnon in the recent past, but those have all settled down. Um, so he argues that, um, that we may actually be in, he doesn't guarantee it, but he says we may be in for a period of calm. Um, so Damon, what do you make of this argument? Well, uh, as, as a pessimist, <laughs> guess what I'm going to say? <laughs> um, I'm not persuaded by this. Now, of course, what do I know? Uh, uh, these kinds of very broad historical trends uh, can change uh, you know, on their own account or because of causes that we can't really tease out, especially in the present. They'll maybe make more sense in retrospect uh, when they are in the past, in, the, in our future. But at the moment, I, I mean, I will say, of course, in the short term, not having Donald Trump trolling the entire country, or at least the, uh, the left-leaning half of the country every single day from the Oval Office with his Twitter account, makes you feel a little less gloomy. I will certainly concede that. It is true about myself. It is true about my family and friends and probably everyone on this podcast that the mm -hmm. sense of intense agitation that somehow the country is falling to pieces in a kind of nervous breakdown has lifted. Um, and in a way, you know, Joe Biden is a kind of genius uh, along these lines. He, he is a master at not uh, taking the bait. He loves to, he loves to do this. He did it throughout the campaign in 2020 and he's done it since he became president. Usually not always, but usually when there is some provocation out there from the right, he simply rolls his eyes, ignores it, and then says some generally, uh, kind of open-minded statement about being the president for all America and Americans want better than that. And that helps to calm things down. So if that's what we're talking about, then sure, I'll concede a, a fair amount of Noah's point. My, my broader skepticism about it is that the things that have brought us here uh, are deeper and more structural than who happens to be in the White House at any given four-year cycle. And those things haven't gone away. Those things include 
uh, what I mentioned in discussing DeSantis and Abbott and other Republicans responding to the coronavirus uh, in terms of a real deep cultural divide between different parts of the country, which, you know, beginning a couple decades ago, we started talking about in terms of blue state and red state. Today, we know that it's not really about states so much it is, as it is sort of city and inner rig suburb versus outer ring suburb or exurban neighborhoods and rural areas. And that these two groups of Americans are not viewing moral questions, political policy questions, and even sometimes epistemic reality itself in the same way. That has not changed, and it is not going to change. And the very fact that governors like Abbott and DeSantis still have modestly good approval ratings despite it all, uh, the very fact that Donald Trump was able to come pretty darn close to winning and actually increased his vote share over four years previously, after everything we saw, shows just how intractably divided we are. And then you add in other structural things like social media and its ability to, and not just social media, but old line media too, the, the tendency to go for screaming headlines and to get ratings and traffic driven to you by always highlighting the negative and, uh, you know, increasing animosity and antagonism in the country. And that's a lot to be uh, trying to swim against, which is, I think, uh, what you would need to do to make Noah correct about this. But then again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's some other factor or many, many factors that are driving a lot of this that I'm not really attuned to. And maybe some shift has taken place that uh, will get us out of it in a way that I can't guess. So what do I know? But that's at least how it looks to me. <laughs> so Linda, um, uh in contrast to the thesis that things are quieting down, you could argue that in some respects, certainly on the right, um, and in some precincts on the left as well, things are actually getting crazier. Um, so you you have the Maricopa County fraud it, it's been called, this absurd uh, so-called audit of, uh, of the ballots where they're looking for bamboo traces. You have... Um, Officials being booed and and harassed in Franklin, Tennessee, sort of an upscale, as I gather, community where they were just having a school board discussion about uh, masking. Um, uh, you have um, this report from the the Brennan Center showing that one in three election officials now feel unsafe in this country. Um, so uh, there are there are worrying signs out there, wouldn't you say that uh, that even though there hasn't been violence, that there that 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 the, the foundations are feeling a little shaky, a little shakier. Well, it hasn't been that long ago that there was violence. I mean, it's you know it was uh, yeah six months ago that we <laughs> had the, six, the ultimate kind ago. of political yeah. violence. Yeah, right. right. So look, I, I guess I'm with Damon on this, um, and my sense is that we are continuing to be deeply divided. I do believe that the number of very far-right crazies who endorse things like the fraud in Arizona, um, you know, who are out there, you know, screaming at uh, parents who want to make sure that their children are safe and want them to wear masks, that that number of group may be getting more vocal, but, but may not be getting larger, that it may in fact be shrinking slightly. However, um, one of the things that we have now that we have not had during past uh, revolutions, as it were, uh, was the huge uh, social media and regular media that has been so polarized and so divisive. I mean, I look back, for example, at uh, the Clinton and the Obama eras. Uh, and I look back at Fox News during that period. Um, I was a Fox News commentator for 14 years. Uh, welcome on all of their shows. Um, I haven't changed the way I talk about issues. I, I could go on those shows and feel comfortable presenting a conservative perspective, but one that was in, uh, based uh, on evidence and uh, not just out there sort of throwing red meat to the crowds. Uh, on programs like the O'Reilly, O'Reilly Factor. Uh, well, the O'Reilly Factor has been, you know, basically replaced as the top show on Fox uh, by Tucker Carlson. 
And whatever Bill O'Reilly's faults might have been, um, and certainly he had personal uh, foibles that brought his downfall, but he was a far uh, fairer arbiter uh, of issues uh, than somebody like Tucker Carlson, who just brings on people uh, in an echo chamber. If he does deign to have somebody from the other side, he usually tries to get the weakest read out there that can, you know, be uh, dismissed and, and made a fool of. Uh, and he's not afraid to do that. And this has this has an effect. And and we have also, I think, much more retreated into our own little world. I don't know about you, but um, I think many of us have begun to become more insular. Uh, we don't have as many friends, uh, not necessarily across party lines, but, but across the kind of uh, ideological divide uh, that divides people who, you know, think Victor Orban uh, is the savior of the Western world uh, compared to, you know, those of us who think democracy is, is threatened in, in that should country. We, should we want to be <laughs> friends with people who are admiring Maybe Victor we Orban? should not. No, maybe we yeah. should not. But, you know, there was a time in the past when I could go out and I could have civil debates over things like immigration where I could try to persuade people who thought that the country was being overrun with people who had, you know, were going to ruin uh, the country that they were underclass and never going to make it. And their kids were going to continue speaking, you know, Spanish and all mm -hmm. these things. And I, you know, we could have discussions, we could debate it. Um, and you could hope to change the other person's mind. I don't feel that we have that anymore. Uh, and so I think we are becoming more insular. And I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong for those of us who want, don't want to be around people who are, you know, we think anti-democratic. Um, but it does mean that there's not a kind of cross-fertilization that at one time would have occurred. And that, I think, is going to deepen uh, the kind of divisions and the chasm uh, that exists. Yeah. Um, so Charlie Sykes, um, a few weeks ago, there was a study, and you don't want to make too much of any one study, but, um, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll cite two, therefore. Um, one was a bright line survey, and it found uh, that 39 percent of those living in the Pacific Coast, uh, the Pacific Coast of the United States, would favor creating a Pacific Coast nation and uh, seceding, and 44 percent of Southerners said that they wanted their region to uh, break off on its own. And among those who, among that 44 percent, it won't surprise you to learn, 66 percent were Republicans, uh, 50 percent independents, 20 percent of Democrats, saying that they would uh, favor creating their own country. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty intense. That's pretty intense. That's why, um, I'd like to believe that Noah is right, but I fundamentally profoundly think that he's wrong. <laughs> I think, I think that all of the pathologies that we've seen, um, over the last several years are all accelerating and they're getting worse. And I would just refer everybody to, uh, Damon Linker's piece, uh, in, 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 in the week where he talks about how the intellectual right is now contemplating an American Caesar. You have, yep. uh, you mentioned Viktor Orban. Um, the Overton window of, of our politics is shifting as more and more of the right moves from kind of small government libertarian conservatism to, to overt, um, you know, fanboy, being, becoming fanboys for authoritarian uh, leaders and are becoming explicitly illiberal. So, uh, you know, Damon asked that question, how does ideological change happens? Um, well, it's because the, it's when the, you know, unthinkable becomes the thinkable. So I do think that I'm watching what's happening, all the centrifugal forces of our politics. I think that they're getting worse. I think that the fact that you have so many millions of Americans believing things that are completely untrue, I think the Venn diagram of people who believe the big lie about the election, um, and the people who uh, doubt the science of vaccines is an indication that we do live on two different planets, and and that and those divisions are, aren't going away, because the the business model of all of these outlets is to you know keep uh, you know keep increasing the the dosage. Um, I've com I've compared them to sort of you know meth labs. In, uh, in Breaking Bad that they have to keep uh, selling more and more potent stuff and that's going to divide us even more. And, well, oh, and, and, to your, and to your question, by the way, I do think that secession is going to become a thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I am calling the shot 
that, that you're going to actually be seeing. It's a ridiculous idea. It's a dangerous idea, but it's almost inevitable given the trajectory we're on. So, Bill Galston, um, yeah, uh, uh, Charlie anticipated me. I was going to tee up a question about uh, about the intellectual currents uh, that we see, you know, in these this parade, for example, of uh, conservative opinion leaders headed by Tucker Carlson, but it didn't start with him, you know, traipsing over to pay obeisance to um, Victor Orban, who's an outright authoritarian, um, and Damon's great piece about uh, about you know, Michael Anton having a long conversation, not uh, not critical, um, uh, with a guy who is calling for uh, uh, an American Caesar or an American uh, dictator. Um, when those things begin to be out there in the ether, um, it's you know among the thinking class. It isn't long before they are they they penetrate uh, right down to the local level. So um, those are the. Those are the pathologies that are out there, and of course there are similar things um, on the left. But I, but but I I tend to think, and I'd be curious what you think about this. You know, I I also find cancel culture reprehensible, and I you know worry about the illiberalism that you find on the left. But I I, I have the sense that they are more exerting their power culturally and not attempting to do so so much politically. What what do you think about that? I think that's exactly right. Uh, and a lot of what's happening in political philosophy or ideology on the Republican side, uh, I think reflects their conclusion that from a small d democratic standpoint, they have lost the war for public opinion on cultural issues, or a lot of it. Uh, and so they are turning to political repression uh, to do what public persuasion uh, has not accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a moment at which our faith in small d democracy is going to be tested. Uh, do we believe that the American people are sensible enough and well enough grounded in democratic instincts, if not democratic knowledge or democratic theory, so that they will recognize this for what it is and reject it? Or is it the case that the level of public frustration has risen in some parts of the political spectrum to such a high level that you could actually get a majority or a large enough minority to accept this sort of thing? I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but I do believe that that is the question. I might add just one other point on the article that sparked all this. Uh, there is a huge caveat at the end of that article. Definitely. And, and that is that all of this depends on the 2024 presidential election. Yep. And if what happens between 2020 and 2024 at the state level is grave enough to make possible uh, a subversion of the actual majority result of presidential elections at the state level, then, you know, the old Ronald Reagan, you ain't seen nothing yet, I think will turn out to be absolutely true. Yeah. Could I add an addendum to your addendum and just point out that um, there could even be uh, a situation that we haven't thought that much about, but you know, if there's a very close race in 2024 that is one that where the Republican does win the Electoral College but loses the popular vote, you could have a really strong reaction from the left, um, which, you know, has seen all too much of that. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that that's another another risk that I think is is out there. All right. Um, let us now turn to our highlights or lowlights uh, of the week, and we'll start with Linda. Well, uh, right while we were on the air, or at least uh, recording our podcast, the Washington Post put out a huge story. Number of white people in U.S. fell for the first time since 1790, new data shows. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, um, of course, I looked at that and said, yeah, let me take a look at the actual numbers here. And then I went to the census uh, page. And it turns out, yes, there are changes. There has been a, uh, a rather large uh, jump uh, in the number of people who are uh, List multiple races, uh, for example, it's it's gone up uh, uh, geometrically, and uh, that is um, in part um, not because there have been a huge influx of new new people into the United States. As we know, the United States population itself is growing at the slowest rate uh, in recent memory, and there aren't huge numbers of for example, immigrants coming in to uh, change the numbers. What it really has to do with is the way in which the Census Bureau itself redrafted uh, the census last year and the kinds of questions they asked specifically on race. And as I have looked at them, uh, it looks very much like, uh, I don't know if it was because Trump thought this would be to his advantage or whether this was you know, being driven by people on the left. I don't know what the reason is, but there was a real effort, I think, to minimize the number of Hispanics, for example, who identify as white. Uh, And in the old questionnaire, you would just check the box for race, and then you would check the box uh, for whether you were Latino, Hispanic, etc. But in the new long form, um, you were asked to actually check white, but then describe what that meant, that your origin was, for example, German or Irish uh, or uh, some other um, European uh, race. And I think that may have had a lot to do with why you saw these numbers change. Uh, And it is uh, of interest to me because the way in which uh, Hispanics have identified racially, which is to have uh, in some some cases a majority, but uh, in almost all uh, recent censuses, at least a plurality, uh, describing themselves as white, uh, if that has been diminished, it is almost uh, entirely, I think, attributable uh, to changes in the way the questions are act, asked and basically a disbelief that uh, those Hispanics who check the white box are truly white. Oh, I wish we didn't ask at all, honestly. Um, I wish we had no uh, no census question about race at all. Wouldn't that be nice? All right. Damon Linker. Well, uh, this actually, like some of Linda's comments, I think uh, fit well with our final segment that we just talked through about uh, the future of the country, optimistic, pessimistic. Um, This is something else from uh, some of the census data that's been released. Um, It's it's a single map. It shows percent change in county population 2010 to 2020 for the entire country. And it is very clear if you look at this map that uh, the, the thing that really stands out is just how dramatic the population is shifting in favor of urban areas and away from rural areas. And that actually, for the medium to long term, I do think provides some glimmer of hope. Because now our system is designed to kind of outweigh the political power of rural areas. But if the population, uh, kind of depopulation of those areas continue at their at their current rates uh, with such shrinkage, even in states States like Texas and North Carolina that are growing quite rapidly. But if it's true that really the only areas of those states that are growing are the cities, like in in Texas, you can clearly see from the map the the very large Dallas-Fort Worth metro area, same with Austin and San Antonio, and then in Houston. Those are what are growing. Everything else, shrinking. If that is the case, and it is also true that the one of the primary variables that help to determine uh, our ideological divides is this rural-urban split, then it does portend a future in which uh, a kind of more center-left politics is is really going to prevail in the, over the long run. Uh, now, I'm usually a, a critic of the kind of demographics will save us, but um, mm-hmm. but when it when it comes to this rural urban split, I think that there really could be uh, uh, some grounds for hope 
that uh, we are moving in a direction and it is not one that is going to favor people who think we need a dictator <laughs> in order <laughs> to rule the country, you know, when they go from 45% to 40% and so forth. Anyway, that's, that's my contribution. Okay. Geographic determinism. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Charlie Sykes. Can I, can I pick any highlight or low light? Anything. Okay, this may be somewhat inside baseball, um, but I, I think the low light of, of the week was the decision by the Bradley Foundation to award the prestigious Bradley Prize to Molly Hemingway. Amen. This is a prize that was once conferred on people like Charles Krauthammer, and to confer it on Molly Hemingway is just such a... It is such a fall, I and mean, Mona knows how I feel about all of this. But also, it's just a reminder of how the the gatekeepers um, of of the right, the people who could have been the gatekeepers of of the right, have instead of playing a positive role, have decided that they're all in on it. And I think it's just if you if you if you look at the trajectory of conservative thought to go from what the Bradley Foundation used to be, what it stood for, to giving a quarter of a million dollar award to um, a retro minged hack like Molly Hemingway is appalling. <laughs> All right. Bill Galston. Well, uh, <laughs> before I get to my highlight, uh, I would simply say that Charlie is absolutely right. Uh, the gatekeepers are busy lowering the drawbridges. Yes. Yes. And the barbarians are swarming in. Surprise. Yeah. A little bit like what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, but uh, I actually focused on the just issued census report as well for some of the reasons that Linda and, and Damon have mentioned. Uh, I'm going to say something that will get me perhaps into trouble uh, but it does reflect my experience as part of the Clinton White House at the time that we were beginning to discuss the design of the of the 2000 census. And already at that point, we were conscious of the ways in which the racial and ethnic categories on the census form had the effect of forcing people into boxes. Uh, and so we tried to loosen up on categories such as self-designation as multiracial or multi-ethnic. Uh, I think the census does more to obscure or distort than reveal if the categories that are used are not appropriate to the actual you know, self-interpretations of the, of the people being polled. Uh, as I as I look at, you know, the meaning of census categories over time, two things jump out at me. First of all, that census categories actually affect political alignments. I mean, this Asian slash Pacific Islander uh, category lumps all sorts of people together who prior to coming to America had nothing whatsoever in common, but in some respects, it has the effect of creating new coalitions where coalitions didn't exist previously. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, the, I guess the, the last point I'd make in that connection is that if you look historically at category like white, its only continuing meaning is not black. Yes, yes. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, uh, Asia, I mean, uh, Italians weren't considered white at first. Jews weren't considered white. And then they were. Yeah. All right. Um, I would like to draw attention uh, to a uh, an action that was taken by the Justice Department this week, which I would like to praise. They have um, obtained a consent decree from the state of New Jersey regarding its lone women's prison. Uh, this prison called the Edna Mahan Prison, uh, the Justice Department did a long investigation and found that it failed to protect inmates from repeated acts of physical and sexual abuse by prison guards. And 
they have uh, obtained this consent decree. Uh, the governor has said he's actually going to close the facility, but they're going to open something else for women. But whatever they open will still be under this agreement where um, there will be better protections for uh, inmates and there will be a uh, federal monitor. But, you know, it, this is not a popular thing. Most people don't care what goes on behind prison walls, but it is a it is a, a sign of a civilized country that we do take uh, steps to make sure that people who we send to prison to be punished are not sent to be tortured. Uh, it cannot be open season on convicts. And uh, it's really, really important that uh, authorities pay attention to what goes on and punish wrongdoing behind prison walls, uh, a place where, unfortunately, uh, it's all too easy to abuse and neglect people. All right. Well, thanks to Charlie Sykes for joining us this week. Thanks to you all for listening. Oh, I looked at the um, some of the ratings on Apple Podcasts this week, and it was it was great. Except that one nice lady <laughs> meant to give us a, a a five star review. She but she put one instead and said, "I love this. It's my favorite podcast." And she gave us a one. <laughs> Brought down our average. So whoever you are out there, if you can go out and re- fix that, that'd be much appreciated. Um, Uh, As to the rest of uh, you, as I say every week, I do read all your letters. I don't get a chance to respond to all of them, but you can reach me at Mona Charon at thebulwark.com. And we will not be back next week. We are taking our first uh, vacation week uh, for the uh, for Beg to Differ, but we will return the week after that. And we wish all of you a very happy summer. (laughs) 